Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's national webinar, Closing the Gap, Critical Partnerships Between Jails and Community-Based Providers to Ensure Continuity of Care. This national webinar is presented by SAMHSA's Gain Center with the support of SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. We still have quite a few folks coming into the virtual space, but we'll go ahead and get started on our introductory remarks so that we can dive right into the content of our presentations. So feel free to come on in and uh, introduce yourself in the chat if you like. Our presenters today are Rachel Katz, Levin Schwartz, Kevin Moore, and Leonid Orzechowski, or, or and I'll introduce them shortly. You can go back to the previous slide, please. I'm Dr. Melissa Stein. I'm a Senior Research Associate with uh, Policy Research Associates and SAMHSA's Gain Center, and I will just be um, covering a few introductory items. Next slide, please. First, the views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Throughout these presentations, we welcome your questions. If you will just submit them through the Q&A portal, we will address as many questions as time permits at the end of the presentations. If you have any issues or questions in regards to the technology, also enter your questions there in the Q&A. We also will have a couple of polls popping up throughout the presentations, and I uh, would really appreciate your participation. So when those polls pop up, just select and, and enter your, your responses. You should have just seen one pop up. Next slide, please. The webinar is being recorded and slides will be disseminated uh, in the next couple of days or so. And we will also let you know when the recording of this webinar is posted to SAMHSA's YouTube channel. We also offer a uh, certificate of attendance available for download at the end of today's webinar. Uh, please note that this is for your portfolio use only, and we are not able to issue CEU credits. We have arranged ASL interpretation for this event. Our ASL interpreters are Linda, Linda Eggy and Kim Morielli. We also have live transcription available. Uh, click live transcript CC and then select show subtitle. Just a quick look at our agenda today. And next slide, please. So our lead from SAMHSA, unfortunately, John Berg was not able to join us today. However, he asked us at the Gaines Center to extend some opening remarks on his behalf. So on behalf of SAMHSA, the Gaines Center welcomes you today uh, to today's webinar on this very important topic of critical partnerships between jails and prisons and community-based treatment providers to support continuous care upon reentry. The weeks following release from jail or prison are literally a matter of life and death for people with mental and substance use disorders. Multiple studies have documented high mortality rates for people transitioning from jails and prisons to community within 90 days of release, with mortality rates highest within two weeks of release. Release from jail or prison can be an overwhelming event for people with behavioral health needs. SAMHSA is very pleased to present two programs with strong partnerships between the local jail and community-based treatment providers to help foster a seamless transition for individuals with substance use disorders and mental illness returning to the community. Thank you to all of you for taking time to participate and learn from today's webinar. And now I'd like to introduce you to our speakers today. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
Rachel Katz is a board certified family nurse practitioner with over 14 years of experience in primary care across the lifespan, most of which has been in rural settings. Ms. Katz has been a practicing addiction clinician for the last eight years and is a strong advocate for incorporating treatment for substance use disorder into the scope of routine primary care. She is a strong proponent of low barrier access to care and firmly believes in incorporating harm reduction principles into all aspects of treatment for substance use disorders. She currently sees patients at the Community Health Center of Franklin County in Greenfield, Massachusetts, where she directs the office-based addiction treatment program and is actively engaged in, in teaching students and residents. She's currently a community faculty member for the NIH-funded Healing Communities Study. Next slide, please. And Levin Schwartz is the Assistant Superintendent of Clinical and Reentry Services at the Franklin County Sheriff's Office. He currently oversees implementation of the Franklin County Sheriff's Office special projects, including their federally licensed opioid treatment program, a number of behavioral health grants, including SAMHSA's MAT, Prescription Drug and Opioid Addiction Grants, and BJA or DOJ's COSAP, Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, and Second Chance Act grants. Levin has co-developed and implemented what has become a nationally recognized mindfulness-based opioid treatment and reentry program at the Franklin County Sheriff's Office. Dr. Kevin Moore is the Executive Director of Courage Medicine in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He has established more than 70 integrative treatment programs, including office-based opioid treatment programs across the East Coast. Dr. Moore established the first HIV-specific intensive outpatient program called Teach Recovery Education Empowerment, or TREE, at, the Philadelphia, at Philadelphia Fight, along with 48 centers of excellence for opioid treatment, including his current nonprofit, Courage Medicine. He and his colleagues published their methodology and outcomes in their book, Integrative Medicine for Vulnerable Populations, a clinical guide to working with chronic and comorbid medical disease, mental illness, and addiction. And Leonard Orzachowski is the National Director of Reentry at Yes Care. He has spent the last six years in correctional reentry. Recently, Mr. Orzachowski served as the Director of Reentry Services for the Philadelphia Department of Prisons. There, he oversaw the design, implementation, and direction of the transformative Release with Care reentry program for the Philadelphia Department of Prisons resulting in a nearly fourfold increase in the Philadelphia Community Partner Network. During his nearly 10 years at Yes Care of Philadelphia, he has held various positions, such as the Facility Health Services Administrator and Regional Quality and Safety Improvement Coordinator. He is a certified correctional health professional. So you've had a chance to meet all of our presenters, and now we'll just take a look at the poll results and see who has joined us for today. So we're seeing a majority of you joining us from urban locations, about 45%, followed by rural, uh, and then suburban, about 20% joining from suburban. In terms of where folks are joining, joining us from, we we'll see the highest proportion of attendees coming from community-based provider organizations. Welcome. That's followed by corrections, probation, and parole at 19%. We also have a good number of folks representing government and policy at 21%. And then I see a number of you joining from other organizations, public health, uh, a few of you coming in from academia, research. And then I see just a scattering of uh, attendees joining from the judiciary, law enforcement, crisis services, and hospital systems. So thank you so much for being with us today, for taking the time out of your day to join us. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel Katz to begin our presentations. Rachel. Hi, everyone. And I'm so glad to be here and, and be talking to everyone. Um, so my name is Rachel Katz. I'm a family nurse practitioner, um, and I was introduced already. So I'm just going to get right into it. Um, let's see. Sorry, slide control. 
So um, our presentation today is split between Levin and myself, um, and between us, we will cover the basic outline of a system of care that is trauma-informed, evidence-based, and allows for a relatively seamless transition between the outside community into the carceral system and then back again. So I'd like to start with a model of the critical components of care, as well as critical gaps and strengths that are particular to our region, and then we will weave a case study throughout the presentation. Levin will take over from his point, sort of inside the wall, talk about the county correctional facility and, and the work that they do. So Franklin County, Massachusetts is located in the Northwest section of Massachusetts and is the most rural and least populous county on the mainland of Massachusetts. Um, Franklin County is also one of the poorest counties with a lower than state average high school graduation rate and completion of bachelor's degrees. Over 10% of our county lives below the federal poverty line. Um, and per capita, Franklin County has the highest incarceration rate in the Commonwealth. So the Community Health Center of Franklin County is a federally qualified health center with two locations in Franklin County and the North Quabbin. Um, we serve as the outpatient safety net for our region, and we serve approximately 8,000 patients across both of our locations. We have a unique mix of particularly vulnerable patients, including folks who are unstably housed, migrant farm workers, people who have dual diagnoses of, of mental health and substance use disorders, and folks who also have very complex medical needs, including hepatitis C, HIV, and congestive heart failure. Year to date, approximately 63% of our patients have met 100% or less of the federal poverty guideline, and the vast majority of our patients are on Medicaid or mass health, as we call it in, the, in this commonwealth. So just to kind of set the scene for, for what we're looking at in our region um, and to sort of talk about why this particular subject is of such importance, um, is looking at the overdose data, right? So I'm an addiction clinician. This is what I specialize in. This data is always upsetting and, and depressing, but this is why we do what we do, because we know that folks are particularly vulnerable when they are transitioning between the outside community into the carceral system and then back again. So if you look at this slide from 2018 to 2001, the rate of opioid overdose across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts increased by approximately 12%. However, if you look at the rate of overdose in our region, so in the four main towns of Athol, Greenfield, Montague, and Orange, our rate of opioid-related overdose deaths increased by 61%. And then I didn't put this in the slide, but if you break it down even further, per capita, um, so per, per 100,000 people, the overdose death rates rose by 100 percent in the town of Athol and by 250 percent in the town of Montague. So in three short years, we've had massive increases in our opioid-related overdose deaths. And to complicate that, overdoses involving cocaine across the county rose by 650 percent. Um, and in 2021, while the absolute number of opioid-related overdose deaths was highest among the white non-Hispanic population, the rate of increase per 100,000 people was highest in the Black non-Hispanic population. And that's important because we all know about some of the racial disparities that affect folks who are incarcerated, and particularly people who are incarcerated who also happen to be using drugs. So this is our first case study. Um, and this case study illustrates our first really critical gap in care. Um, and that critical gap is the provision of trauma-informed, harm reduction-focused, and non-stigmatizing care. So our initial case study presents with a 43-year-old Caucasian male with a history of intravenous drug use. So he initially presented to the health center both for psychiatric medications as well as medications for opioid use disorder. Particularly, specifically, he was requesting Adderall and buprenorphine naloxone or Suboxone. His initial toxicology screen, which was done in-house, was positive for heroin, fentanyl, methamphetamine, cocaine, and buprenorphine. We also interrogated the statewide prescription monitoring database, and this did reveal past prescriptions for Adderall and Suboxone, both of which were several months old, but had been issued by one of our clinicians. So his initial visit was with myself um, as a primary care clinician and the director of our OVAT treatment program. And we did decide to provide him with a seven-day prescription for Suboxone and, and Adderall. Um, and a follow-up appointment was made with our nurse care manager for one week. So why would I provide a prescription for Adderall, even though he tested positive for cocaine and, and methamphetamine? 
um, because that is trauma-informed harm reduction focused care. We could see in his chart that he had a documented history of, of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, as well as past prescriptions for Adderall. I gave him extensive patient education about the dangers of mixing certain substances, particularly the dangers of mixing cocaine and um, other illicit drugs with any prescribed medications. Um, and we had an, an open and honest conversation about it. And the main reason that we decided to do this or that I decided to do this as the prescriber was rapport building. So by, a, by being able to meet him where he was at, provide him with something that he was looking for, we were able to start to form a rapport and able to continue to get some traction in his care. So for those who are not super familiar, OBAT, which is Office-Based Addiction Treatment, is a model of treating addiction in the context of primary care. And what really makes OBOT different and separate is that it actually uses registered nurses as nurse care managers. So our OBOT nurses are the primary therapeutic relationship. They are the primary clinicians that touch base with patients who do visit, who are really the, the in and out, sort of the daily grind of interacting with these patients. Um, this allows each nurse to practice at the very top of their license, and what it does then is it also allows primary care clinicians and other addiction clinicians to have a, a more effective use of their time. Um, the OBOT model was pioneered by Boston Medical Center and has been sort of widely known as the Massachusetts model. The OBAT model at its core always recognizes the importance of patient-led decision-making, trauma-informed care, and using harm reduction as the basis for all things that we do. OBOT is also a medication-first model, and so we allow patients to enter into OBOT care at any stage of their recovery. There is no requirement for abstinence, and we do not require anything like therapy or participation in 12-step programs or any group attendance. So without a requirement for complete abstinence from drugs, patients are able to enter into a system of care in whatever way best suits them. And we're able to meet them where they're at from a harm reduction focused and allow them to pursue treatment in whatever way um, best suits them and, and feels best for them. So our, continuing our case study, so our patient returned one week later to see the nurse care manager. Um, so by providing that initial prescription for the medication he was looking for, including Adderall, we were able to bring him back into care, which often in and of itself is a huge win. At that point, his urine toxicology was positive for heroin, fentanyl, methamphetamine, and buprenorphine. He endorsed some continued illicit heroin and fentanyl use but stated that he did not need to use cocaine when he was taking his appropriate dose of Adderall. So we automatically already met one major step in his goal of recovery and in keeping him safe, which was that we were able to help him discontinue illicit cocaine use. And if you remember back to the original, um, one of the original slides I put up, our overdose deaths in this county involving cocaine have risen by 650% over the last three years. So by providing him with a medication and meeting him where he's at, we were able to help him reduce really risky and dangerous drug use. Hi. So OBOT specifically at our health center. Um, so year to date, our clinicians and our nurses have seen approximately 350 patients with a diagnosis of opioid use disorder. So the program at our site, our clinic, we have 1.5 FTE, so essentially one and a half full-time nurses that work five days a week. They cover each other um, to provide care and, and visits. So we're able to do same day, next day visits for initiation of buprenorphine. Um, we also provide sublocade, naltrexone, and Vivitrol. Um, we, our OBOT is fully embedded in our primary care setting, so that allows for these really seamless transitions between addiction care, primary care, sexual and reproductive health care, as well as fairly easy referrals to dental care and, and behavioral health care. Um, the presence of our nurse care managers in the OBOT is really crucial to the ease in which the OBOT functions. Nurse care managers act as liaisons between the health center and the outside agency, um, and they also are able to connect with folks like community health workers, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So at his next visit, 
Um, the patient revealed with the nurse care manager that he had actually previously been incarcerated and had recently been released. And at this point, he was struggling with some housing. Um, he owns a house, but was struggling with some tenants and, and keeping up with repairs. Um, and he did not have his driver's license. His license had been taken away. So he was really struggling to get his license back. Um, based on his history of incarceration, our nurse care manager was able to put in a referral for our particular um, community health worker who is based out of our jail. And so he was able to connect with him. So this sort of reveals another critical gap in care, which is our ability to continue to provide care despite major social determinants of health or despite major barriers that were put up. So our particular community health worker reached out multiple times to this patient and never heard back. Um, and so, you know, what we understand is that really by providing trauma-informed care or trauma-responsive care, we know that past history of trauma interferes with someone's re reflection of their self and with others, and that there are going to be huge barriers to care that may prevent them from reaching out in a way that we would typically expect from a patient. And so despite these barriers, despite this patient not reaching back out, our community health worker continued to reach out to him, let him know that he was there, sort of allowed him to come back and, and meet him on his own terms. Luckily, because we are co-located with our community health workers and with this particular community health worker who is located just next door with our Justice Reentry Center, we were actually able to grab our community health worker at this patient's next visit with the nurse care manager and physically bring him into the office. And so that reveals a critical care gap as well, is that the importance of co-location really cannot be underestimated. That this patient was really tricky to track down. He had a lot of barriers in the way. He wasn't returning phone calls, and yet he was still coming in to see us. He had formed this really incredible, important relationship both with myself and with the registered nurse who was helping to take care of him. And by physically being present in the clinic, we were able to connect him with this really important community link um, of, of our nurse, of our community health worker. Um, so that also brings up the fact that we never discharge patients from our OBAT um, unless there's a really dangerous behavior. We have a very clear behavior contract. So patients understand that at the very beginning, um, you know, we understand the, the role of trauma and the cumulative effects of poverty, incarceration, and, and the war on drugs. And we understand that these things get in the way of accessing care in a mainstream way. So patients are welcome to return to OBAT at any point if they self-discharge or if they continue with drug use, we're always going to meet him, meet them where they're at. Um, so unfortunately, after meeting with this particular community health worker, this patient was picked up and, and reincarcerated on a drug-related charge. So I think what this really highlights is this model of peer plus kind of care. Um, so we know that people with all kinds of chronic disease have better outcomes when there is peer support and modeling. And this is especially true for folks with substance use disorders. So peer support is integral at all stages of recovery. And at the health center and through our OBOT, we utilize what we sort of call a peer plus model. And that's with our use of community health workers. So community health workers are able to be present in the community, meeting patients in their homes, in their tents, where they're living. They're able to provide assistance with things such as housing applications, rides to medical visits, accessing DBT. Um, DHWs are also able to connect with patients on a level that's a lot different than clinical staff. I am well aware that as a clinician, I am in an ivory tower. I have the power of a prescription pad. Um, and our community health workers are really able to, you know, get into the community. Again, really meet people where they're at, be harm reduction um, focused and help to navigate some of these more informal care systems. All right, that is the end of my presentation and I will pass it over to, to Levin who's gonna continue from there. Thanks, Rachel. And um, hi everybody, my name is Levin Schwartz. Um, disclaimer, I'm a social worker, so this is gonna be kind of behaviorally infused <laughs> in, in this next part. So um, we're all too familiar with the revolving door of incarceration. Um, Historically, the United States' carceral system's main strategy towards behavioral change was through this adverse control or punishment strategy. And the systems have been built to provide security rather than treatment. So traditional training is typically paramilitary. And this leads towards procedural knowledge, right, which does have its place, but it doesn't necessarily teach the skills needed to 
de-escalate or validate clients' experiences. And we know that these are at the heart of effective intervention. And the systems, it has compounded the problem by inadvertently reinforcing like institutional narratives and fusion with a sense of criminal self-identity in clients. And you know, there's more few people more fused with this self-story than folks who are incarcerated because the story has been rehearsed so many times. So um, in 2015, the Council of State Governments did a justice reinvestment analysis in Massachusetts, which is the slide you're looking at. And they discovered that 60% of individuals in county corrections have been incarcerated five to 11 or more times. So we named this presentation from the community to the jail and back again, because we're looking at these gaps that, that revolve around the in, out, out, in perspective of the system. The carceral systems are historically hierarchical and they're top-down models that create these artificial silos. So it divides people, it divides department to department, staff to inmate, community to facility. Security staff really had nothing to do with behavioral health staff and vice versa. Historically, the community had very little to do with the facility and vice versa. The systems historically have lacked collaborate, collaboration and it's kind of blunted communication between these different departments. So when elected in 2011, Sheriff Christopher Donlin had a vision that departed from this punishment or containment paradigm. He pushed the system to believe in a treatment paradigm, one in which public safety was best attained from an evidence-based public health trauma-informed treatment model. And if we're gonna to continue to incarcerate people, they should be released better than when they entered. So towards that end in 2013, with the help of Kevin Warwick and Alternative Solutions Associates, the National Institute of Corrections and the Urban Institute, we were awarded a Transitions from Jail to Community uh, Technical Assistance Grant, which helped us to transform the context of incarceration from a top-down approach to a hub and spoke model with the client at the center. Uh, we moved away from terms like inmate and replaced them with client. We created an integrated behavioral health model that allows all departments to work together as one. At the heart of the transformation is the emphasis put on staff training and development. And we've seen that the better people are trained, the better they are at creating an environment of trauma-informed care. Training staff, both uniformed and non-uniform alike, in modern mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapies, it naturally cultivates a trauma-responsive environment as it's destigmatizing by nature. We offer modern evidence-based treatments that depart from traditional stigmatized approaches found in tra traditional correctional continuum or curriculums like moral recognition therapy. These modalities are not trauma-informed and, they're, they're, and the rationale for how they understand addiction and how it affects criminal behavior is just outdated. The models reduce generalize, and they generalize individuals' involvement in the justice system by explaining it as like a moral failure. So modern approaches look at the function of behavior in specific contexts and takes morality and stigma out of the picture. So from a treatment perspective, one critical gap would be I would encourage us to reevaluate these treatment modalities. And I hope that future research focuses on modern evidence-based behavioral health treatments in county correction facilities. So our treatment paradigm in simple behavior terms, and um, I'll say that you know, for more information, see Dr. Russ Harris on this uh, for in-depth in descriptions. But if we break it down, um, there's a way moves. And these are things that we do primarily to get relief from an adverse experience. These are behaviors that are typically reactive or often highly effective in the short run to get, uh, but tend to make our lives worse in the long run. Think substance use or violence as good examples. These are adverse control. And then there's towards moves. These are actions that we choose on an ongoing basis and they're qualities and actions that we that take us and move us towards a meaningful life, like being a patient father or being a consistent coworker. This is appetitive control. Traditional CBT approaches look to dispute, challenge, fight, replace maladaptive thoughts with more adaptive thoughts. And if you see it through the lens of a trauma-informed approach, this work is, it can be highly re invalidating as it's saying that the problem is in the way in which people are thinking. Modern approaches look to notice thoughts and decide and invite an individual to ask if it's beneficial or workable or useful, um, and will it lead that individual towards who and what matters most to them, i.e. their values. And so, you know, behavior of individuals struggling in the justice system is often dominated by behavior under adverse control. These are short-term solutions, which are, again, are very effective in the moment, but explain a lot of behavior we see connected to addiction. So individuals continuing to use heroin to avoid withdrawal symptoms, or individuals who have experienced trauma using substances to numb painful memories or to help with sleep. 
people who act violently because they're feeling scared or judged or angry. So there's significant evidence to suggest that long-term behavior change is not connected to necessarily the absence of adverse control, but the development of appetitive controls. In other words, engaging in behaviors that connect to a sense of meaning and purpose in one's life. So let's return back to that client that we were just talking about. Rachel, go ahead. All right. So because of the community health worker um, who is employed sort of dually through the health center and, and through the Franklin County Sheriff's Office was able to actually meet with this particular patient again once he was reincarcerated. So this really highlights sort of the fifth critical gap in our community as the community health workers are able to bridge the divide between the outside community and the healthcare facility or the outside community and the carceral system. And then again, as you'll see, back to the outside community. Um, so actually, since these slides were created, um, our patient has been released from jail. But when we were um, creating these slides, the patient had been reincarcerated. He was able to meet with the community health worker behind the wall, and they were able to start develop, developing some pre-release planning because of the really incredible and innovative ways that our particular county jail um, provides MOUD, so medications for opioid use disorder, this particular patient was able to bridge seamlessly the buprenorphine that was prescribed on the outpatient side to buprenorphine on the behind the wall on the inside. He actually was then transitioned to methadone because we are a county jail that has a fully embedded OTP. So he was able to transition to methadone and get stable on methadone. Um, while he was incarcerated, the community health worker and myself, as well as the nurse care manager, remained in really close contact. And so we were able to start planning from a community-based perspective for his release, for what he would need. Um, you know, we were informed when he was transitioned to methadone, so we weren't so, so worried about the buprenorphine prescription. Um, but then we were prepared to, to, again, sort of reestablish him with primary care at the health center. So we are a federally designated opioid treatment program, and we started in 2018. We're one of three jails in the country with our own OTP license. So, you know, to just to say some facilities may, instead of going an OTP, they may prefer to partner with a local OBOT or a methadone provider to ensure that the needs met. So this would be a critical gap to identify to ensure this access to the continuity of care. We do provide all three forms of MOUD, so methadone, buprenorphine, and injectable naltrexone. We assess everyone for OUD and all the patients entering the facility, and our data indicates that over 55% of admissions experience an OUD. We utilize a state prescription drug monitoring program and obtain last dose letters from methadone clinics, and we screen for co-occurring disorders. We offer induction and maintenance for all OUD patients, both pretrial and sentenced alike, and we develop outreach and engagement strategies to ensure continuity of care, such as e-prescribing upon release or bridge scripts to ensure no loss of medication due to appointment wait times. We use telehealth services, we provide peer recovery support services, and smoking cessation and infectious disease screening and treatment. Beyond our collaboration with our outpatient providers of the Community Health Center and the Center for Human Development, one of our most important relationships is um, our relationship with our local research institution, UMass Amherst, and our dear friend and colleague, Dr. Liz Evans. In 2018, we started this collaboration with CHC and CHD and UMass Amherst when we were awarded a three-year SAMHSA Matt Padoa grant. And we're thankful that we've been awarded for a five-year expansion grant to continue this work uh, in 2021. This slide and the next three slides are from Dr. Evans. And she discovered that nearly 50% of clients currently receiving mood in our MOUD in our facility had not been on MOUD in the community. Uh, of those folks, Roughly 4% four four of the individuals declined MOUD when they were offered it in the facility, and the rest of them um, had an uptake in, in, in utilizing MOUD, 80% utilized methadone, and roughly 16% utilized buprenorphine. Nearly 64% were screened positive for co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. Nearly 94% reported being bothered by psychological or emotional problems, and 33%, roughly, reported having been prescribed medication for a psychological or emotional problem. Remarkably, most individuals struggling with an opioid use disorder have experienced trauma. It's not surprising, but the numbers are remarkable. And with really roughly 91% of those reported struggling severely with those symptoms. And so this is another major critical gap. And I posit that 
This gap is critical to breaking the epidemic of incarceration. We must move from trauma-informed approaches to trauma-responsive treatment for this population. The chart to the right is our current census. And the two graphs, we use this for you know, tracking purposes and, and dispensing purposes. The two graphs to the left show the length of stay at FCSO by census, uh, sentence, sentence status. And so um, the average length of stay for sentence patients was 104 days. We know when they're getting out and, and there's a, a set time. The average length of stay for pretrial patients was 23 days, and we averaged roughly 20 releases a month for individuals who are utilizing MOUD. So this is the third critical gap, the rapid and unpredictable release of the pretrial population. The pretrial population is the most difficult to serve. It's the most transient population, abrupt transfers in care due to court releases and bail. And we, you know, when we have to re ensure that the post-release supports are established. So insurance activation, aftercare appointments, transportation on day of release, housing resources, basic needs, hygiene, food security, showers, laundry, all of this needs to be taken care of, coordination with the court, post-release re-entry support, these are all critical. And moreover, past patient focus groups emphasize the important role of a post-release re-entry caseworker in maintaining their treatment trajectories post-release. And what, what they noticed was that the therapeutic relationship amongst these two individuals was the most important variable. So once we understood the context of pretrial MLUD patients, we adapted our system to provide rapid re-entry assessment, rapid re-entry planning, and post-release casework for the entire pretrial population. We created contingency management groups to expedite rapport uh, building and incentivize participation in re-entry services, and I'll return to this subject in a moment. We started a pretrial checklist for re-entry services. We increased the collaboration with the courts and our community OBOT and methadone clinic. We increased staff flexibility to be able to respond to rapid releases. We deployed a, a texting app for a mass communication, and we implemented telehealth services. It's just an example of a re-entry plan, which every client leaves with. Highlighted in the bottom is all the appointments connected to MOUD and, and continuity of services, whether it's, whether it's mental health or, or um, primary care. And notably, we onboard almost everyone into Medicaid, including pretrial detainees. So closing this critical gap is pivotal, as it's the gateway to the community-based services. Our model of treatment be, be some, uh, begins once someone enters the facility and continues till after they leave, and treatment focuses on intensive skill building and psychological skill building, all oriented towards mindfulness-based care, paying a particular attention to the underlying factors common to most everyone who's incarcerated, which is the struggle to act effectively under great adversity, stigma, uh, addiction, what shows up on the outside. Um, the goal is to create an environment that balances the use of both adverse and repetitive control, returning back to this initial part of our conversation. The pivot point from the community engagement to treatment while incarcerated and back again to the community is quite tricky. And so for both structural and psychological reasons, there's a lot of internal barriers that show up as a client gets ready to leave. So fear of entering unfamiliar environments, fear of failure, stigma in the community, the struggle that inherently comes with repairing relationships and forging new paths. And and of course, there's structural barriers, and this is why the collaboration between um, the collaboration is critical, and it allows for the establishment of a therapeutic alliance that spans the structural boundaries of incarceration. So whether it's fear or mistrust, or insurance activation, or a concrete wall, I mean, these barriers need to be spanned so that someone can continue to the work both inside and out, and out and back again. Our contingency management. Um, was established to expedite rapport building for this very quick, rapid turnaround. Most evidence-based treatments in correctional facilities um, it focus on skill building. And so this program was purposely designed to be experiential and relationship-based. We called it Addiction Treatment and Recovery and with the acronym ATARI. And it, it's an open enrollment, voluntary, incentivized reentry group grounded in acceptance and commitment therapy. And the primary function of it is to ensure the continuity of care. So the reentry caseworker or the community health worker, which Rachel was talking about, they facilitate unique cohorts with clients they're assigned to when they come into the facility. And the group is designed so that the reentry caseworker can learn about specific information with the client that can inform specific case management strategies. And the group curriculum is designed around value-based recovery themes. Of course, the second function is to increase behavioral activation. Again, there's a lot of evidence to support the importance of freely chosen, value-oriented action being a vital component of mental health 
primarily because these actions hold intrinsic value. The value is in the doing and not necessarily the outcome. The slide to the, uh, to the bottom right is a commitment card we made to help clients track their freely chosen commitments and the goals they made that help to shape and reinforce new behavioral patterns in the service of the client's unique values. So um, in closing, the next steps, we continue to need a more seamless transition. I mean, the risk of overdose is highest in the first few weeks of release. We need research to be funded uh, to provide high quality studies analyzing modern evidence-based treatments in houses of correction. There's a real vacuum in the research out there um, as it mostly focuses on long-term carceral environments. We need to move from trauma-informed approaches to trauma-responsive treatment. For many clients, incarceration is the most stable living environment they know. We, we must do better at treating trauma specifically and understanding the different ways trauma plays out across genders. For example, in our facility, nearly all women incarcerated report trauma, all have an OUD, and almost all of them report current or historical commercial sexual exploitation. And finally, we need to continue our inside out and outside in approach as it helps to potentiate the therapeutic alliance and increase community support post-release. Rachel? So our final conclusion, again, um, these slides were created a little bit earlier, but our particular patient was released. Um, he has been released from jail, has already been in contact with the community health worker as well as the nurse care manager. He was able to establish with a community-based opioid treatment program to continue his methadone, and he does continue to have his psychiatric medications prescribed through the health center. So this case highlights the critical care gaps that we've identified in our community, the importance of low barrier access to MOUD and non-stigmatizing care, the ability of registered nurses to run an office-based addiction treatment program, the critical importance of trauma-informed care and understanding multiple pathways to recovery and how co-location can facilitate and empower collaborative care. And also the employment of community-based individuals to act as peer plus community workers or healthcare navigators. And so by leveraging the OBAT nurses and the community health workers, we're able to thread the needle to ensure that our patients get the highest quality of care that we can give them in the lowest barrier setting possible so that they can reach their goals of recovery in whatever those might look like. Thank you. And I think we will now pass it off to, um, to the other team, Dr. Moore and Leonard. Thank you. Uh, my name is Leonard Zakowski. I'll be presenting today with Dr. Kevin Moore. Um, We'll be talking about components and gaps in the transition system um, between jail and community-based treatment. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll notice for, we'll be going back and forth because I'll be presenting kind of from the correctional setting, whether it be the medical provider, behavioral health provider, or um, the correctional system. And Dr. Moore will be presenting from the community provider aspect. Um, all right, so here's our first slide. Um, we have listed here gaps. So we'll start off with um, failure identify a need. Um, so with this, I mean, a lot of times you'll see in a correctional setting, it's especially in a jail setting, you're moving people through the system as quickly as possible. And there's not time taken to identify um, what needs of the patient there are. And, and you can see right here, and, and these numbers on this, this slide are represent, representative of one locale, but I mean, we found they're, they're pretty similar across the board. Um, and when we look at this, we can get this data from reports or from patient questionnaires, but we really want to look at a lot of times those with chronic medical condi conditions, substance use disorders, and those on MAT, and those on the behavioral health caseload or with a serious mental illness. Um, additionally, you can implement the use of evidence-based risk assessment tools to uh, further dive into identifying patient needs. Um, another gap or is the lack of patient information on community resources. We'll find that a lot of them, most of the time, don't know where they're going or don't have any plan to follow up with a physician in the community post-release, even if they have one of these conditions. And then before I hand it over to Kevin, um, of course, many of them don't have medical assistance, or if they do, they don't know how to utilize it, or they need assistance getting other identification information. 
Um, you'll hear time and time again in our presentation, uh, reducing barriers is essential for um, the system to work through the use of robust relationships and communication between the correctional system and community providers, um, as well as over and over again, the need for medical assistance or an application for it. Kevin? Thanks, Len. Um, I, before, I, before I dive in, I wanna pick up on this point of medical assistance in a moment, but I just wanna say those last presenters, oh my gosh, uh, that was fantastic. And um, I mean, I do similar work and I have a similar um, clinical orientation, but I feel like they condensed everything into these little um, bite-sized pieces and then fed them to us really quickly. Uh, so thank you so much for that. I really, uh, I really appreciated uh, that. So um, uh, back to our presentation, it's a little bit different. Well, that was very clinically focused and very um, um, sort of theoretically driven in a way in terms of explaining different um, uh, uh, clinical frameworks for things. Um, Lynn and I are, are a little bit more uh, sort of practical, I'd say, a little more systems oriented. Um, and so um, this is a this is going to be, a, I think, a very uh, complimentary um, uh, presentation in that it looks at um, uh, more systems factors than very clinical factors. Anyway. Yeah. Um, what, so, are, what are the problems? How to avoid them? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, exactly. Um, so as a community provider, um, the when we engage somebody new, um, if, if they're um, if, if they're coming from a correctional facility or not, it's, you know, you, you, any community provider, you're going to check insurance. You're going to do that very early in your process. And then that can lead to a lot of different ways, depending on X, Y, and Z. Um, one of the, one of the sort of beautiful things that um, Lynn was able to, to create uh, and is not creating uh, in a nationwide model is that if the, um, if pre-release those, um, those needs uh, are met, that there's, there's a queued up medical assistance application that can be um, submitted at time of release, and the provider knows this because we've gotten a referral. Um, that that cuts that our, our efficiency, our our ability to to readily engage uh, in treatment activities um, is just it's just critical. Um, you know, we we live in a system where everything's um, built around uh, around insurance, and if you don't um, pay a lot of attention to this, uh, it just slows everything down. People fall through the gaps. And um, as everyone here um, knows, um, really bad things happen then. So um, uh, really, I want to I want to uh, say uh, thanks to Lynn and to, and to all of the sort of correctional um, uh, facility administrators and, and workers um, who make that sort of possible, so that the community provider um, can 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 pick up uh, and help uh, individuals um, coming back into the community. Um, so that's just that's just really really crucial. Um, now, having said that, um, we have found that we that as, as they're passing off to us, we need to do inrage. Um, as a community provider, um, we um, uh, have kind of done various uh, um, evaluations on this. Um, research is maybe a little strong, some research, um, but we've done a lot of evaluations of different models and so forth. And if we don't send an inrage, if we don't have someone from our clinic that goes into uh, a carceral setting, and um, meets people um, at least once, I'll talk about that in a minute, um, that people don't come. People come maybe 15% of the time. That might be a familiar number to many of uh, those uh, uh, who do this. However, we have found that when we do go in um, uh, at least once, um, that um, essentially doubles um, uh, the amount of participation and that that is uh, something that we need to do um, uh, in order to make these connections happen. Um, now, uh, upon um, uh, uh, someone coming into the community, um, life is often very chaotic. They maybe not have good uh, access to transportation. They're not sure what's going on. Um, and so one of the things that my um, facility practices is open scheduling. Um, when we're open, anyone can, can come in. Um, it's sort of a, similar to the free clinic model with a, with a variation of um, that we, um, uh, you know, say that um, we did once they once people have had an intake, we say please come back in a week, two weeks, whatever the whatever the interval might be, and then that's a Tuesday person. Now a Tuesday person can also come on Monday, um, but um, we have some sense of of um, volume and we try to spread out volume and so forth. Um, but uh, it also means that you know we're open nine to five. 
um, there's a and with some evening hours um, on Wednesdays, and so there's a there's a large target for them to hit, hopefully, um, and that um, we might have to ask that there some of their patients if it happens to be a particularly busy time. But generally speaking, we can we're staffed in a way that we can handle the volume. So um, uh, uh, appointment availability is really really key. Um, if you say you can only come next Thursday at two o'clock, and if you come at two fifteen, you won't be seen you are not going to engage um, uh, the population effectively uh, in our team. Um, finally, um, uh, we try to have low barriers to participation, meaning um, people that want services can receive them and that we don't have to have them prove X, Y, and Z first. Um, one example is um, that someone needs to be proved that they're stably housed to participate in some services like, well, I don't know, hep C treatment. Um, or, or something like that, that, um, that for them to receive certain types of drug treatment, uh, they need um, to show sobriety first. I think this is completely backwards, um, that, uh, that, 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 is, that that is needed um, uh, to be shown. Um, so in, in any case, um, to, to, to be as low threshold as possible um, is uh, another sort of important ingredient in our solving these problems. Lynn? All right. So with that, we'll just get right into the correctional setting piece of this and uh, focusing on um, that seamless transition, right? So our, our first aspect is really establishing or setting up community provider partnerships. Um, they're essential for establishing a network of community resources for patients reentering the community. Um, now, we're not just talking about community providers, it's also peer support groups, case management organizations. Um, and when we are looking into these different aspects, it's always good to start with federally qualified health centers, centers of excellence, accredited organizations, so on and so forth. Establishing partnerships allows both the community provider and the correction system um, to have a better understanding of each other's processes and set in place a working relationship so that would best suit the patient needs. Um, again, uh, the, the most seamless to remove any barriers for the patient. Um, this is just so that they can focus on their own personal growth and not have to worry about cracking down their care or again, um, getting medical assistance in line. If we have a good working relationship with a good community provider network, then the patient is able to focus on the rest of their life and their own rehabilitation. Um, with a provider network, it's also important to set up a process workflow. Um, now, depending on your situation, you might be looking at a prison or a jail setting. Um, a lot of what we're talking about today is, is a jail setting, but you still deal with a sentence population and a pretrial population, um, even though it's like, uh, <laughs> what, nine to one? <laughs> um, so uh, with a sentence population, you, you have a lot more time to plan. It's not, as Levin was saying, a very transitional um, community. Uh, so you can make arrangements for housing for appointments. Um, in a pretrial setting, they can get out at any time. So it's really important to focus on providing as much resources, as much information, as much understanding to the patients, having a system for that, um, to distribute it to them, to begin the process at intake. I mean, you'll hear time, time and time again, reentry starts at intake. That's the truth because you have to keep, um, keep providing information keep assessing the pacing, keep assessing for the needs. Um, next is the community provider selection. Um, now, this is important to note. We, you always want to make it, one, participation optional, because you, you, something like reentry, you never want to force upon somebody. It's not going to work. Um, so, one, it's optional, and two, uh, the community provider selected is based on patient choice. If you're going to have a network of providers, and I'm sure Kevin agrees, but um, I don't want to show favoritism to one or the other. It needs to be the patient choice. Mm -hmm. And that's why I bring up this map here. 
Um, now you can have a list of your providers, or you could say that you could develop a map like this and say to your patient, where do you live? Or where do you plan on going upon release? And then you zoom in on that address and you show them what resources are closest to them that would fit, fit their needs. Um, this way, you're taking yourself and your own biases out of the, the calculation. Um, obviously, you build a map of, like I said, centers of excellence, FQHCs, accredited organizations. So they're all good choices and you're not guiding them to just one. Um, so this way, again, removing another barrier because you're getting the patient care that is close to where they plan on being, make it even easier for them to get to that. Um, next is process consistency and uh, data tracking. Uh, this is just important um, so that you can track your progress, track outcomes, calculate outcomes. Um, and it's also a tool for continued improvement. So I just have this mentioned here because many times it's not thought of until later. And it's hard to go back and collect that data after it's already happened. Um, another a key factor in setting up a program like this is remembering patient consent and setting up consistent forms. So one thing that we focused on, which helped us a lot, and it may be uh, a possibility in your organization or your locale, um, and may not be in others, but we actually worked with uh, the city law department to modify the intake consent form so that on the form, it included items such as um, language for medical assistance services and communicating with their physician in the community. This way, all of the consent for reentry needs were again initiated at intake. So um, if, you, if you continue to think in that, that mindset of let's start at intake and utilize those resources through and through, then um, I think you'll be good. All right, next slide. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Um, let me um, sort of weave in some of the questions that have come in um, uh, as, as we're going, if I may. Um, we had a question about, about medical assistance uh, and why it's meaningful in relation to patient health and social well-being uh, to retain activation of Medicaid during incarceration and reentry. Um, we were expressing an opinion about um, uh, maintaining Medicaid. That's a that's a sort of a, a complicated thing, uh, legally speaking. I know there's been some creative um, attitudes depending on what state you're in. Um, in the in the instance that that Lynn and I are referring to in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania um, always uh, shuts off med uh, Medicaid or tries to always shut off Medicaid upon incarceration. However, they allow the team to um, uh, uh, create the application and that their model is to, um, to submit it on day of release so that as a provider agency, we know what insurance that, they, that they're going to have that's going to be retroactive um, to the date of application. And then we can just proceed as if they are, um, uh, they do have uh, active Medicaid. Even if we look in the system and we see, we see it hasn't been processed yet, if they come that day, the next day or something, um, it's not always that fast. Be turned on, but it uh, it gets turned on um, uh, retroactively, so we can just proceed. So I hope that that sort of clears up that in this instance. Um, yeah, and we'll dive into medical yeah. assistance more, obviously. But I mean, we always want to highlight that important factor that I mean, community provider partnerships are are not even possible without medical assistance. Right. Um, at least medical assistance at discharge or an application for coverage, right? Yeah, exactly. It's it's the thing that makes our work even kind of possible. Um, so that's 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 that piece. Um, so uh, it, it's hard to balance um, staffing resources. Um, I mentioned um, before that it was important that community organizations do at least some inreach. Um, I've I've had um, uh, the opportunity to kind of do different models. Uh, we used to try to um, see people as many times as possible as long as that they were incarcerated. Um, because it was a, a jail setting, you know, that was a variable uh, length of time. Um, but really interestingly, when we um, looked at the numbers, when we analyzed our own data, we did not see a significant increase um, after an initial visit. Um, meaning, um, the if, if people are referred um, and there's no inreach, it's about 15%. And then if we if there's a if there's one visit from the the, the partner agency, the, the outpatient um, 
sorry, the community agency doing inReach, um, it roughly doubled to about 30, but then at two, three, four um, subsequent visits, it never really got above 32, maybe 34%. And that's a lot of time, you know, and this is not time that is, um, that's covered. We can't charge Medicaid for inReach. Um, but if we don't do inReach, the patients don't, they don't come. So um, the right balance for us um, is that, um, you know, to do one uh, and, and typically only one um, uh, in-reach visit um, as, as a partner agency. Um, having said that, um, we try to be really, really consistent and make sure that there, there is one um, because everyone can, can have an equal opportunity to try to feel connected, to try to um, have a relationship and to have a friendly face. The way that we have, um, we have a dedicated um, peer specialist uh, who does our in-reach uh, at our agency. And so um, they're going um, into the jail, um, also a prison, but that's a longer story, um, and, and meeting with folks. And then he's in the, he's in the clinic the other times. So when people actually come in, they see a familiar face. Um, he knows that they're, he, he knows to sort of expect them, can have a conversation with them and make them feel, feel comfortable. And this is a really big piece of what I call the stickiness it, it dramatically increases um, sort of the long-term um, uh, treatment relationship uh, with these individuals, and um, even if uh, even if the, the peer specialist isn't really the point of contact, you know, may or may not be. Um, just that that extra effort is the thing that uh, is kind of the secret sauce, uh, as it were. So, big fans of that. Um, and then I've already talked about uh, open scheduling and uh, having a lot of appointment availability is um, is the, the um, programmatic feature. Um, to make a successful program. I've already talked about um, um, how low threshold models or low barrier models uh, of care to meet individuals where they're at. Um, we heard um, in the last presentation um, about harm reduction uh, treatment. Uh, I, could have, uh, I, I could have said that exact same um, statement. I really loved uh, how they said it, um, that um, we are meeting uh, indiv individuals where they're at, that um, people coming out of um, uh, carceral settings um, are trying to reestablish their life. They're trying to deal with trauma. They're trying to figure out their relationship to, to substances, to their mental health, to their physical health. And um, uh, we try to um, take a, as broad a view as we possibly can and um, not assume that they're particularly interested, for example, in uh, maybe someone is interested in um, suboxone treatment but doesn't care about their, their HIV medication or the reverse of that. Um, and so um, we, we try to um, meet them where they're at and give them the services that they're interested in and use motivational interviewing as a tool um, to interest them in other things that um, we think might also be, be problem areas for them to, um, uh, to continue to function well. Um, so to utilize a harm reduction, a model of service provision, um, uh, it might mean um, something like um, syringe exchange. We don't actually uh, are not um, providers of that particular service. Um, but definitely we give out a lot of Narcan, definitely we try to have a harm reduction uh, orientation um, uh, to services and to have as many um, related treatment uh, services as possible. Um, uh, Courage Medicine, my agency, uh, we're very lucky in that we have a very broad range of, um, we do um, primary care, we do um, psychotherapy, um, we do psychiatric medication management, we do SDI testing and treatment. Um, we do um, uh, MOUD, Suboxone, um, and, uh, and, and then um, care coordination and case management to um, other services that we don't provide uh, and actively um, um, follow up and try to arrange those. So um, I, I, I think that's part of it too, that it's, we try to be a one-stop shop. Um, it's hard enough um, for people to kind of get anywhere. Um, and uh, if they do make it somewhere to have as many of, uh, of interlocking needs that they might have met as possible. Um, uh, we've, we've, so we've talked about the Medicaid piece here. Um, I, I guess I wanna um, jump to, to two more questions that, that came up in chat. Are there working relationships with the Division of Adult Parole or Probation and your agency for entry services? Absolutely. Um, we are talking to POs uh, daily. Um, and that that's um, sort of a, a, a piece of things. And um, uh, I, yeah, I could, I could go into that uh, a bit more if, there, if there's interest, but um, I, I guess for the, the community provider wants as many other community uh, relationships as possible, certainly with um, uh, probation and parole, um, but also um, uh, 
uh, other other services that we don't provide, like methadone, for example, um, that we need to have good relationships with them. And then um, finally, the the last question that I see in chat directed specifically, I think to me, um, and and also to Lynn, I'm, I'm going to pass this back to him. How do you assess the quality of community-based treatment, uh, and how does that influence your referrals? So this is for Lynn, but I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to set it up a little bit. Um, I I agree with what Lynn said earlier when he had the map out that 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 services should be local and that um, transportation being such a major uh, factor that um, yeah, individuals should, should choose their own care and that any referring agency shouldn't say, you need to go to this place, but like, here's some options uh, of where you're gonna be that, and here's the services that they provide. I also think it's fair to say um, we have a working relationship with them and we know of, I don't know, dozens of or hundreds of um, other um, people uh, leaving incarceration that have gotten good services here. I think that's just sort of um, accurate representation of, um, uh, of, of different services. Um, but um, I, I agree that there shouldn't be favoritism in terms of um, partner relationships that haven't been sort of like earned over and over um, through, um, through the data that's presented. To go back to Lynn's other point that you need to track data from the very beginning to know what's working and what's not working and to, and to analyze that data and have an informed view of, uh, of what makes sense. But uh, let me turn that question directly to you, Lynn. How would you answer the question of uh, well, how do you evaluate the quality of uh, community referrals? I, I mean, I, I think you hit on, on most of the topics, and I did mention before, we, we tend to focus on the, um, the community providers that are federally qualified or centers of excellence or um, accredited organizations, but also um, no community provider partnership is set up without review by our clinical board or chief medical officer or um, Chief of Behavioral Health. So there is a vetting process internally with YesCare um, to, to make sure that we're only guiding patients to providers that we know will provide the appropriate level of continuity of care. Um, we don't want to send them to, let's say, a pill mill, um, and then they're just back in our door again a couple weeks later. Um, we prefer to send them someplace like Courage Medicine where, again, one-stop shop, harm reduction model, um, kind of get provide all the services under one roof to make it as streamlined as possible for the patient, seamless as possible for the patient, and remove as bar many barriers as possible. So um, I, I think it would just be, the simple answer would be a vetting process, right? Awesome, thank you. <laughs> yep. So this next slide, I will, I know we're short on time, so I'm gonna skim through this pretty quickly. Um, I do want to say that um, what I'm discussing on this slide is only examples um, because it it varies from state to state, but some of it may be similar in your state or municipality. Um, but we, we touched on MA a number of times, and it's not only important for the community provider to keep their doors open and continue providing patient care in the community, uh, but it's also it also enables the patient to utilize services in the community and remove, again, the barriers of managing their own enrollment process. Um, because of the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion, there were a number of new legislative changes. Um, one that we utilized in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania um, was one that identified inmates as having zero income and therefore eligible. Um, and another thing that came a little bit later, and this is kind of just changes to the system, was um, the ability to activate coverage to suspension status. Um, we're seeing that a lot across the nation, and that's, that's really helpful because that means we can initiate that um, enrollment process while they're still incarcerated instead of just waiting till the day they're released and getting retroactive coverage. Um, so you'll see these different changes across the nation, but um, those are important to look out for as a way to either identify how you can start the process and get that enrollment going or done at the time of discharge, um, or, um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, at the time of discharge or get it done beforehand and put them into suspension status so it can be turned on right away. Um, what we did in Philadelphia was we set up agreements with the Department of Health and Human Services, the local office, and so on for um, processing time agreements to get quick turnaround time so we could get these things turned on right away. Um, 
to do coverage verification to uh, limit the amount of resource use in doing applications if coverage was already seen active in the system. Um, and we work with them to set up a, a streamlined uh, application process for inmates because a lot of the answers were standardized across the board if somebody was incarcerated. Um, and one key factor, again, to, to understand is, at least in, in Pennsylvania, we could only make arrangements for persons with residents within the state. So um, there are some other barriers, but a lot of times we found we could avoid some barriers for patients by having community partnerships with providers that are in other states, because if we were to release them to their care, then they have access to that enrollment process in that state. So just some things to think about. All right, so this will be our last slide. Um, we're gonna go back and forth on this one. <laughs> um, it's kind of a give and take, but uh, so first I'll talk about the referral process. Um, it's important when you engage with the patient and assess their willingness to participate in a reentry program, um, you have to identify their needs and review the community resources with them, gather their demographic information and contact information. Um, these things are important so that community providers can attempt outreach, in reach, right, to the patient or outreach to the patient post release. Um, it's also important to include any other needs the patient may have outside of, say, medical, behavioral health, substance use conditions. Um, Maybe they need housing assistance, food assistance. I can go on. <laughs> but include those so that um, planning can begin with the community provider pre-release um, so that they can align with the patient for whenever they are released. Kevin? Yeah, um, I, the, the, when we get a heads up, when we get a referral um, that is um, – we know not only to send our inreach um, uh, person uh, to come and have a conversation, but we can begin um, to, to to understand what we'll be um, working with the person with. Um, you know, if they if they can show up. Let me. Um, I'm I'm going to hit both the question and chat from the anonymous attendee saying, um, "Do you make appointments with community partners pre-release, and if so, how does that work?" And tie that directly to this first bullet point under community providers. Um, again, with open access scheduling, we're doing intakes whenever we're open. So Monday through Friday and uh, nine to five plus uh, evenings on, on Wednesday. And so there's no wrong time uh, to, um, uh, to come in and we throw the biggest net that we can so that we can, um, and, and we ask people to come in immediately. Oh, this, is, this is a key point. When we're doing inReach, we just say, as soon as you get out, please come into our center and give them the information um, uh, as soon as you can, right? Um, if we get some people to come in same day, Generally, people come in kind of in the first week or two or something, um, and as soon as they can, it, the, the, as soon as we can establish them uh, as our patient, um, you know, sort of the better. And then we've gotten a heads up from both the referral process and our in-reach visit um, to, um, uh, I mean, it doesn't complete our entire intake, but it gives us a really great head start so that we can be efficient and, uh, and meet, their, meet their needs and do it, um, and do it flexibly. Um, we've talked about Medicaid sort of a bit. I don't want to repeat that here. Um, so, I mean, but this is a, a good point where I, I mentioned it before, but um, this is where you'll prepare and submit the medical assistance application, either at discharge or at intake. Again, it's going to vary by location, but realistically, um, throughout this process of meeting with the patient and getting their consent and, and, and buy into the reentry program, this is also the time when you'll be doing that. Um, and from Kevin's standpoint, we have that agreement, we have that understanding between each other that he's not going to get a referral from me unless they have active coverage or they have an application for it. Yep. Yep, and that's and that 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 level of trust, and also just that the system works, right? That that we don't um, uh, that it doesn't work most of the time because then we're stuck with somebody who doesn't have insurance, and then we have a whole other thing, and we've sort of skipped a big, big, huge pothole in, in their care, frankly. Um, so again, just sort of like the having having a, a dependable system, a dependable partner, is uh, something that takes a long time to to figure out. Um, and you know that you have a dependable partner because you take data. 
you know that you have a dependable partner because you can look at who's everyone who has referred in the last six months, year, whatever, how many of those people um, were we seeing that I that we can turnkey that uh, information um, back to our our, our, our corrections partner um, is uh, and, and for us to know that you know our efforts in reach and, and so forth um, are are worthwhile are are are, are addressing this really important need. Um, so um, that's that's part of those things. Um, I, I know we're running a little late on time. But there's one more yep. question I wanted to pull out of chat. Um, which is, are you working with non-clinical community-based organizations? And if so, what does that look like? Culturally specific organizations, faith-based organizations, uh, and so forth. Absolutely. I know that my my examples, I only gave clinical examples, um, but yes, it's very important to have a variety of community partners, um, both clinical and non-clinical. And um, we have a lot of those, um, particularly um, uh, a lot of uh, LGBTQ um, plus um, community members um, uh, benefit from um, connections to those organizations, uh, and it helps um, dramatically um, to keep uh, those folks uh, in care, uh, among many others. Thank you. Yep, uh, same here. And I had mentioned before, we work with case management organizations, um, uh, peer support organizations, so on and so forth. Um, the, the last thing I just will mention is um, it, it the importance of communication between the correctional setting and the community providers is key. Um, it's important that you insist them with gaining access to the patient's pre-release because it, it is a process. <laughs> um, provide them with the tools to make contact with the patients post-release. Again, we talked about the patient demographics and contact information. Um, and then we utilize our own tools such as a notification system, incarceration records, um, in which when the patient is released, even after they've gotten the referral, weeks go by, right, Kevin? Mm -hmm. And then you guys get a notification from us saying that they've been released. It's now time to attempt outreach. This has been found key because that's when they know, okay, we need to start looking for them in the society and get them to our door. Um, and it's also important to understand, I have listed there, it says ID sheet and medical summary. We provide them with the medical summary at time of release, right? It goes to the patient and the community provider but also the incarceration record or their face sheet because has their picture on it actually in many jurisdictions functions as a form of ID. Yep. So I will leave it at that. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I guess thank we'll you. go to questions. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much to all of our presenters today. I think everyone um, has just been taking in so much information, but we do want to cover a few more questions. So um, buckle up folks, we'll um, just dash through a few questions before the close of our webinar. We will get everyone offline by 5 p.m. Eastern time, which is where I'm located. Um, so funding has come up. There have been questions about, well, how do you fund all of this wonderful work? So I would like to start with our partners in Massachusetts and in particular that community health worker uh, the peer community health worker. Um, how is that funded? And, and could you give more information about that particular role? Sure, Rachel, let me take a stab at it first and then if you have things to add. So we were fortunate enough to be awarded a, a Matt Padoa grant from SAMHSA. And so in that, in 2019 to 2021 was the initial um, Grant and so then that we got re we got uh, an extension grant in 2021 for five years. So, in written into that grant was a um, community health worker from the community health center and then a clinician from the center for human development, focusing specifically on our pretrial population. So that's currently how we are funding that position. Oh, um, is this the same position that's co-funded? Okay, so could you provide more just detail around that partner, that co-funded uh, approach and, and, and how that was set up? I think that that might be of interest to our, our listeners. Rachel, do you want to speak to that at all or do you want me to continue? Sure. I mean, my my understanding of it is that it's a what's called a pass-through grant um, through SAMHSA. So I believe it was a co-application or the health center did the application. And so the grant, the money comes to us as a health entity, and then it gets passed through um, to the Franklin County Sheriff's Office. So in that way, we are able to have this particular community health worker have full access to both systems. 
Um, so one of the really amazing things that, that can happen with this kind of system is that our community health worker actually has full access to our electronic medical record um, because he is also technically an employee of the health center. So he can register patients in the health center. He can help them schedule appointments. Um, you know, he can send me or the nurses internal um, internal messages about things that the patient might need. So that's my understanding of the grant. Um, Levin might have a, a slightly more nuanced understanding of it. No, I think you spoke better than I did. So thank you. <laughs> and then in turn... In terms of funding, I do just want to also note that um, for folks who are using OBAT nurses, it actually is a self-sustaining um, proposition. So nurses can bill um, for all of the visits that they do. And at least in Massachusetts, and because we're a federally qualified health center, nursing visits get reimbursed at the same rate as provider visits. So every visit that they do with a patient for their office-based addiction treatment and care gets reimbursed by insurance. So there is some startup cost, and we were lucky to get some money through the NIH Healing Community Study that allowed us to expand the program, but they are, have now become completely self-sustaining. Thank you for that. And there were a couple of questions that came up regarding um, Medicaid coverage in counties. And I don't know if that's an issue in your counties, if your state handles Medicaid differently, but apparently in some states, if the, if the Medicaid is in one county, they have to have some time to move it to a different county. Is that something that either one of uh, the groups have to deal with? Not in Massachusetts, but I, I yeah. will say this, which is that Forging an, a, a strong partnership and relationship with Medicaid at the state level um, is, is just is critical. During COVID, during rapid releasing, when we would get two hours notice when a homeless person on methadone who had a GPS bracelet that they had to figure out how to charge was getting released and didn't have active insurance, we were faced with this life, like critical, life-sustaining question, which is, how are they going to access all the things they need? And so... So, reaching out to 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 the Mass Health led um, representatives in your state and seeing seeing putting creative minds together, I think, can yield really positive results. At least it did in Massachusetts. Thank you for that. Um, how about um, Pennsylvania? Um, there's um, uh, the way that the physical health Medicaid is structured in Pennsylvania, it, there's not, um, it's, uh, it's, it's by region. And so it's rare that there's a problem uh, across county line. Um, it's a little bit different for uh, behavioral health. Um, uh, but uh, generally speaking, it's, 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 it's okay regardless of where people are released. That's an overgeneralization, but it's not a huge problem in my opinion. Yeah, there's, there's more, it, it is, it is county based, but in your county there'll be more saturation doesn't mean there's no resources anywhere else in the state but um yeah we haven't seen too much issue with it except for like you said on the behavioral side where yeah it's a little trickier yeah all right so um i'm going to land with one last question um there were several requests regarding screenings and assessments. So um, we'd love to just end with some comments regarding both group, from both groups about what screening and assessment tools you use for substance use disorder, um, uh, mental illness, and trauma. Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Moore. Uh, sure. Um, so we have a, a standardized intake that, that includes the ASAM for, um, uh, for substance abuse assessment. Um, we do. We are not currently using a, a standardized mental health assessment, but we rely on interview. Um, and what, there's a third part to your question. What was the third part? Any trauma assessments or trauma screenings? Uh, no. Yeah, we don't have a standardized uh, trauma screening, but that is uh, foremost on our mind in terms of um, providing um, uh, trauma informed care, trauma uh, responsive care. Um, we 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 think that that's nearly universal in the populations that we serve. So. Um, that's that's very much um, sort of a part of that, but we don't use a, a standardized screen at this time. I think beyond that, <clears throat> um, we use similar assessments that Dr. Moore was re reporting on. We use the adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. assessment just to get a sense of um, not diagnostic criteria, but just to get a sense of what shows up in a person's presentation that's been informed from the past. I think we're gonna to move towards, and we're, we're at a pivot point in our program right now where we are 
looking to to implement a more universal trauma screen. You know, the PCL civilian score is is one um, for symptomology, and um, but we're still exploring because. We, we, we do believe that trauma really is at the heart of so much of the presentation that we're seeing. Couldn't agree more, couldn't agree more. Um, there, I, I, I can also throw in that we do, we do use a, a BARC-10, a Brief Assessment of Recovery Capital, which is a very broad measure of um, social determinants of health. Um, so I, I, I failed to mention that, that it is relevant. Thank you for that. Okay, so um, we're coming to the end of our time today. There were so many wonderful questions and we will keep track of these questions. And if there is anything further we can do with our presenters, we will. But uh, for now, we're gonna have to come to the close of the webinar. I know many of you are eager to get out of your offices, whether you're at home or in uh, your, your office building. And uh, right now you should see in the chat, there's going to be a certificate of webinar attendance in the chat. Uh, just keep a watch for that. Ashley Sabatino just dropped it in the chat. If you will click on that, you can download it directly to the uh, your computer. And I, I feel like I'm on the home uh, network channel selling something. Look for the chat. Look for your attendance uh, certificate and download it now. Um, don't miss your opportunity. Thank you so much to our presenters, uh, Miss Katz. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Rachel Levin, Leonard, and, and Kevin. Um, wonderful presentations and just a, a really, two really wonderful examples of how to create some solid jail programming, community based programming, and bring those together to really and truly care for the individuals that are interfacing with our systems um, and, and need some support in their recovery. So, um, once again, if you will just look in the chat, you'll see that certificate there drop down, you can um, download it. We've also got a couple of resources that are available for download. When we share the slides, you will be able to click on these links and uh, download them. And again, Ashley is dropping them into the chat as well. For those of you who would like more information, those are two publications, Transition from Jail to Community Initiative and then Medication Assisted Treatment for Opioid Use Disorders in Jail and Prison Toolkit. Those are two really wonderful um, publications with more information. Next slide, please. And if you haven't signed up for the Game Center's listserv, please do that. Uh, you can just take, type this URL in your favorite browser, and um, that will take you to a page where you can sign up for the Game Center's listserv, and there you will get updates regarding webinars, um, and, and anything else coming out from the game center on these issues. So again, um, just thank you so much to our presenters for your time and, and sharing with your expertise today. And thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. Um, we look for, forward to seeing you at the next games webinar. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Take care, thank you.